Hello, recording. It's just me. Wait. Repeat the show, please.
Good morning, everybody. See that all the speakers are here, thankfully. So, if anyone wants to share their screen just to check if um, there's an issue with. I think you were breaking up a little bit. Were you asking us to sh test our share option? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, no worries. Share option. 
at the session. We have nine people. We can just start with the set of presentations scheduled in this panel. So I'll introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Candice Bond is an associate professor of English at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia, where she's also the di director of the University Center for Writing Excellence. Bond's literary research focuses on identity politics and public urban spaces in modernist fiction. She's also an active researcher in the fields of rhetoric in composition and writing center studies. Her scholarship has been published in several journals and in this feminist writing center journal and WLN journal of writing center scholarship. So you can start with your presentation. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm going to share my screen. All right, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for coming to the session. Today, the title of my talk is The Road Was a Jungle, Street Harassment in the Years. And that quote actually comes from the Pargeters, um, which was an earlier iteration of the years. I do have my uh, chat pulled up. So um, if at any point you have questions or comments, you can throw them up and I'll look at them later. Uh, my talk today is taken from a chapter in the forthcoming collection, Modernism and Me Too, edited by Jerrica Jordan and Robin Field. This anthology focuses on modernism's representations of sexual violence against women and considers the ways that modernist uh, text and authors antecedent concerns prevalent in the 21st century Me Too movement. Today, I will focus on the ways that Wolf conceptualized and theorized street harassment, I argue she took the subject of street harassment seriously 100 years before it became mainstream, linking it to imperialism, fascism, and patriarchy. I do want to warn attendees that my talk will focus on depictions of sexual violence, so please feel uh, free to leave at any time if the talk becomes triggering in any way. To refresh your memory about the recent interest in the topic of street harassment and its connections to the Me Too movement, I turned to the 2014 short film, 10 Hours of Walking in New York City as a Woman, published by the nonprofit organization Hollow Back. The film was uh, made by Rob Bliss Creative and featured a woman walking in New York City while subjected to unsolicited catcalls and sexual comments from men. Nonprofit organizations like Hollow Back and scholar activists like sociologist Holly Curl, founder of StopStreetHarassment.org and author of several books and surveys on the topic, made the term street harassment mainstream. In 
Although the term was first used by anthropologists, legal scholars, and women's rights activists in the 1980s, it was not until the 2010s, the Hollaback film, and Alyssa Milano's now famous 2017 Me Too tweet that the term gained momentum. So I'm not going to play this uh, film for you, but you all have access to the PowerPoint. And if you haven't seen it, you can go back and watch it later. Within the context of the 21st century, Curl has defined street harassment as unwanted interactions in public spaces between strangers that are motivated by a person's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, or gender expression that make the harassee feel annoyed, angry, humiliated, or scared. She continues explaining that street harassment can take place on, excuse my page turn, on streets, in stores, on public transportation, in parks, and at beaches. It ranges from verbal harassment to flashing, to following, groping, and in an extreme form, even rape. It differs from issues like sexual harassment in school and the workplace, or dating or domestic violence, because it happens between strangers in public spaces which at present means there is little legal recourse. In other words, street harassment occurs in modern public spaces, the same types of spaces defining many modernist texts, plots, and aesthetics. As I wrote a dissertation on authors such as Wolf, Ian Forster, and Joseph Conrad between 2013 and 2016, I noticed how many texts featured scenes depicting what we would now uh, recognize as street harassment. The shift of women into the workforce and public spaces in the 19th and 20th centuries correlated with increasing instances of street harassment. Focusing on London's West End, Judith R. Walkowitz writes, in late Victorian England, street harassment emerged as a social problem and a social issue. When unaccompanied middle-class women and the new class fractions of clerks and smartly dressed shop assistants became a masked presence in the city center, thus entering the privileged spaces of politics and commerce and especially consumption. Wachowitz's archival research reveals the ways women's magazines instructed women on how to avoid male pests, that's the word that was frequently used, in the street. These publications frequently taught women it was their fault if men bothered them in public spaces, hinting at early iterations of rape culture and victim blaming narratives that have become the focus of so many 21st century Me Too stories. Writing nearly a century before terms like street harassment and the hashtag movement Me Too became mainstream, many modernist authors, including Virginia Woolf, anticipated the connection between public spaces and sexual violence against women and children. And they connected this tension not only to consumerism and work, but to larger sociopolitical systemic issues related to women's freedom and human rights, such as capitalism, war, nationalism, imperialism, and patriarchy. They also connected the phenomenon of street harassment to ongoing individual and cultural trauma. Rather than trivializing sexual violence in the streets, modernist authors interrogated its connection to lifelong pain, repression, and fragmentation of subjectivity, which is such a recurrent theme in modernist fiction. Wolf was explicitly conscious of the phenomenon of street harassment and was actively working through its effects on female subjectivity as she drafted her novel essay, The Pargeters, which became The Years and Three Guineas. Susan Squire and Elizabeth Evans give the most in-depth analysis of Wolf's conception of what we now call street harassment, what Wolf then called street love. Quoting from The Pargeters, Squire's writes, to the men belong the streets with their largely male force that Wolf calls street love, which is, and this is coming from the Pargeters, different from other loves inside the drawing room, and which both controls the streets and besieges the private home on all sides. Evans too connects street love to Wolf's theorizing of women's oppression. Quoting from the Pargeters, Evans notes that street love is exemplary of, and this is coming from the Pargeters, of the kind of passion which pressing on the walls of Abercorn Terrace made it impossible for the Pargeter girls to walk in the West End alone or to go out after dark unless they had a maid or brother with them. Although critics like Squire and Evans have discussed the element of street love in the Pargeters at length, primarily by focusing on scenes that were omitted from the later novel, The Years, I want to draw attention to the only major scene of street harassment that Wolf did leave in the published novel. This scene involves young Rose Pargeter, and it's actually the opening uh, chapter of the novel in the 1880 section. Wolf's depictions of childhood street harassment show how both men and women are conditioned in patriarchal societies to accept sexual violence 
as inherent to modern subjectivity and sociopolitical relations from an early age. Wolf depicts her female child protagonist City Walk as an imperial adventure that eventually leads to lifelong disillusionment and unrest. Rose's experience suggests that patriarchal imperialism begets a culture of generalized violence, which in turn normalizes violence against and by women, cultivating a culture of nationalism that is not too distant from fascism and that absolutely contributes to war. Like Three Guineas, where Wolf claimed England and the English private home were just as fascist as the countries it claimed to disdain, the years unveils how, imperialist, how imperial and capitalist ideologies rely upon the subordination and exploitation of women and children, and also how women and men become complicit within these ideological uh, frameworks. At the start of the novel, Rose longs to break out of her patriarchal household that exists on the threshold between conservative and progressive views of gender, empire, and economy. Defying her older sister's rule not to leave the house alone after dark, she sneaks out to travel to Lamley's shop where she wants to purchase a toy, saying, now the adventure has begun. Rose imagines her walk as an imperial military conquest, a likely narrative considering the height of the English empire in the 1880s when Rose's walk takes place. As she prepares to leave the house, she thinks now she must provide herself with ammunition and provisions. And I'm not going to read the long passage that's been on your screen, but hopefully you've been able to look at it and you can see that she continues to imagine, you know, herself riding along on her on Pargeter's horse uh, to the shop as though she's on some military conquest. So in this passage, Wolf suggests that women seeking equality and power within their limited domestic worlds look to the militancy of empire as a possible outlet, just as young boys might. However, Rose, who initially imagines herself to be a conqueror, is disempowered when she is harassed by a pedophile on the street. Rose instantly registers the older man's uh, presence as predatory, and her reaction is fear. The narrator states, as she ran past the pillar box, the figure of a man suddenly emerged under the gas lamp. The enemy, Rose cried to herself, the enemy, bang, she cried, pulling the trigger of her pistol and looking him full in the face as she passed. When she sees the man's face, however, Rose thinks it was a horrid face, white, peeled, pockmarked. He leered at her. He put out his arm as if to stop her. He almost caught her. She dashed past him. The game was over. She was herself again, a little girl who had disobeyed her sister in her house shoes, flying for safety to Lamley shop. The man's presence ends Rose game and makes her feel unsafe. Rose's reaction to street harassment suggests Wolf's awareness of how such everyday acts uh, that reinforce women's social conditioning from childhood on can lead to lifelong trauma that reshape the entire course of women's lives and their families' intergenerational futures. The use of the word leer and the man's attempt to grab Rose heighten her fear, pointing to the seriousness of the offense. Once in Lamley's, Rose is distracted by her anxiety and she dreads the journey home. She attempts to take up her game on her way back, but to no effect as fear now consumes her. On her way back, the man's behavior becomes more explicitly sexual. As she passed, he sucked his lips in and out. He made a mewing noise, but he did not stretch his hands out at her. They were unbuttoning his clothes. The threat of sexual violence drives Rose back to the clenches of the patriarchal home she so longed to escape, forcing her to accept this domestic space on new terms. The narrator explains, she fled past the man. She thought she heard him coming after her. She heard his feet padding on the pavement. Everything shook as she ran. Pink and black spots danced before her eyes as she ran up the doorstep, fitted her key in the latch, and opened the hall door. In the immediate moment, Rose's fear transforms her perception of herself as someone who has power into someone who has none, and it transforms her view of the public imperial space as an arena of play, adventure, and fulfillment into one of fear and exclusion. She returns to the home grateful for the safety it provides, a far cry from her orig original desire to escape its grasp. Readers can easily see the long-term impact of Rose's experience in her decision to become a militant suffragette and a supporter of the war efforts. Rather than retreat into domesticity forever, although it is her initial instinct to do so, Rose chooses to seek out violence as a means of empowerment. Violence has stripped her of her power, and so her perceived only recourse is to herself adopt a militant stance. Thomas Davis reads these, or these decisions as a form of psychopathology rather than heroic activism, 
a reading that resonates with Wolf's critiques of the suffragette movement and war in Three Guineas. At its heart then, The Years is ultimately a novel concerned with how nations justify cultural narratives of war and violence, even though these same narratives um, repeatedly inhibit individual and national progress. The scene of street harassment paired with Wolf's arguments in Three Guineas suggests it is only by breaking the cycle of sexual violence against women and children that a nation can begin to imagine a new social order grounded in pacifism rather than violence. This means men and women must reject the alluring idyllic narratives of imperialism that shaped their childhoods and imagine something entirely new and different. Um, so to close, I did just wanna point out that I know a lot of people have talked about wolf and, and sexual violence. So I'm not sure if this reading today is radical um, in any sense, although I'm not sure if people have focused so much on Rose as I have. Um, but one thing that I do think that is quite radical is thinking about the years as a silence breaking text. So if you remember the Me Too uh, movement um, and then Time Magazine published its, its issue on the silence breakers and really focused on the importance of speaking out. And I think that the Me Too movement in general, that's kind of been its foundation is the importance of just speaking um, about these experiences. Uh, so when Rose returns home, she wants to tell her family. Uh, she, it says she hoped somebody would come out and speak to her, but no one does. Um, and she ends up going upstairs and she has a nightmare about the man, but Eleanor, come, her big sister, uh, comes to comfort her. And Rose cannot communicate to Eleanor what has happened, but Eleanor does absorb Rose's trauma in a very significant way. And um, on a nonverbal plane, it seems that Eleanor understands that something she, she keeps saying, the horror, it's kind of reminiscent of Conrad in the Heart of Darkness. And um, she says something horrific has happened to Rose and she understands that. And Eleanor actually asks Rose several times throughout their lives, you know, what happened? And Rose never tells her, but Eleanor understands it's something big um, that has changed Rose, you know, at her very core. And several other members of the Pargeter family, uh, especially the women, talk with Rose over the years through, throughout the decades about um, what happened to her when she was young. And again, she never vocalizes it explicitly, but they all understand that it has changed her life and the family's life. Um, so I would argue that Wolf as a novelist is a silence breaker in a way, because even though Rose cannot speak the words, we as readers have seen what has happened. The narrator has spoken it for uh, Rose. We, we still see it and we hear it. And we take that back out with us into the world and it changes how we view uh, street harassment or other forms of sexual violence. Um, so in that way, I do think that Wolf's decision to leave this scene in, in the novel is very intentional. And I think that Wolf uh, would argue today, you know, for the importance of removing the stigma and shame and speaking out about these experiences as the first step uh, for, for changing things and making positive change. So I will uh, close there. I do have a work cited page at the end that you all can revisit. Um, and I have additional references as well. The chapter this was taken from also includes discussions of H.G. Wells' novel, Anne Veronica, and James Joyce's uh, short story, An Encounter from Dubliners, um, which has a very, very similar scene of child street, childhood street harassment, um, almost identical to Rose's experience, interestingly, but from a male child's perspective. Um, so there are additional sources about this topic that I'm happy to share as well if anyone wants them. But thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Maybe we can just take a two minute break to think of um, certain questions that we may ask you towards the end. So we can just have a short break of two minutes and then we can move on to the next presentation. I hope that's okay. Fortunately, we're now also joined by other people. So um, yeah, let's just wait for two minutes. 
All right. Um, okay, so I'll just introduce our second speaker. James Bowen is a final year undergraduate at Merton College, Oxford, where he will remain next year to pursue an MST in literature, 1900 to present. Beyond Wolf, his research interests lie primarily in British modernism, post-Freudian psychoanalysis, and their intersections with theory and continental philosophy. He's presently working on articles on both J.M. Kodzi and Kazuo Ishiguro. James, please start with your presentation. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming. I'm sorry about my voice, by the way. I'll uh, just share my screen. Right. <clears throat> um, right, I should say before I start, um, there is uh, towards the end of this presentation a reference uh, to depictions of sexual violence. Uh, I'll reiterate the warning when we get to it, and it's also on the access copy, but I thought it would be best to make that clear from the outset. Okay, I'd like to begin with an image, which I hope might act as a useful conceptual map for what follows. In his book, Zizek in the Clinic, the psychotherapist Elliot Rosenstock describes the use of chess pieces as a tool for exploring the client's relationship with power dynamics. He outlines the following. There are five piece chess pieces set up in a pentagram, the pawn, the knight, the rook, the queen, and the king. The client then imagines the conversations between these pieces based on the assumptions that the pawn symbolizes the subject under the influence of authority, the knight is both subjugated and has authority, the rook is a piece representing foundational structure, the queen is a female, possibly maternal authority, and the king is a male, possibly paternal authority. I did not intend an opening with this model to embark on a Zizekian reading of Mrs. Dalloway, much as this might itself prove productive. Rather, I gesture here towards a, more, a broader psychologically minded approach to Wolf's form and its ethics, advancing the contention that Wolf's characters and their narrative functions can be meaningfully explored in terms of their psychological independence. Quite how this operates will, I hope, be clearer by the end of this, my remarks today. In this paper, I will argue that, applying the chess model to Mrs. Dalloway, we might read Hugh Whitbread, an uncomfortably situated rook figure, foundation of a, foundational of a latent, heteronormative, sometimes violently oppressive system of patriarchal authority that acts as an undercurrent throughout the novel. Closely attending to the lexical and syntactic peculiarities of his presentation, I will explore his unusually numinal status within the generally phenomenal concerns of Mrs. Dalloway and how this shapes his participation in the various forms of ethics at work in the novel. With this in mind, I propose the following relational model of the novel central characters. I shall avoid dwelling on this as a totalizing reading, both for lack of time and for its broadly rehearsing the familiar notions of political power outlined in Alex Ferdling's essay, Mrs. Dalloway and the Social System. The inclusion of Hugh Whitbread within the schema, however, a character often dismissed or neglected entirely in critical reading, demands a fuller explanation. Sverdling himself, indeed, spends little time on the figure of Whitbread, but is nevertheless quick to point out as exemplifying a broader need to dominate born of the habit of power. It is this conception of social power as habituated that I wish to turn to first in exploring the curious lack of intersubjectivity around Whitbread, despite his recurrence across the novel. His first appearance is significant both for its content and its placement, inasmuch as he is the first person Clarissa directly encounters, barring her way and interrupting her private thoughts at the same time as granting the reader further insight into the social world she inhabits. Is thusly. Who should be coming along with his back against the government buildings most appropriately, carrying a dispatch box stamped with the royal arms? Who but Hugh Whitbread, her old friend Hugh, the admirable Hugh? We shall return to the various collocations in this passage over the course of this paper, but for the moment let us begin with the adverbial framing. Before we know who he is, Wolf gives us a clear sense of what Hugh Whitbread is and what he stands for in the notion that he is most appropriately, an adverb applied uniquely to him, framed by the seat of state power. The grammatical slippage here is doubly telling, as it's not entirely clear whether the appropriateness in Clarissa's mind is directly related to his appearing where he does, or that he's carrying one of the iconic red dispatch boxes, presumably containing state documents for the monarch, that continue to play a role in the government in government service. As an aside, the phrase wasn't continued to appears twice in Merve Emre's note explaining the function of the dispatch boxes in her recent annotated edition for Liveride, further emphasizing the inevitable continuity of tradition. Both his presence and his function then are framed as necessary facts of existence, as though he's as much a part of the landscape Clarissa moves through as the architecture of London. Before we even know his name, Hugh Whitbread is subtly but unequivocally associated not just with overt manifestations of power, but his situation in a long tradition of established prestige, prestige and privileged knowledge. Like the government buildings, as Rook figure, he stands for both physical and epistemic power at a foundational level, something we see further in Clarissa's oddly stilted syntax when identifying him directly. <clears throat> 
The division between old friend and admirable seems strangely harsh, perhaps even unwilling, and gestures towards the recurrent and familiar question of the division between public and private selves that preoccupies Wolf across her work, only in this case from interaction with an external force as opposed to the private reflections that underpin the narrative. Naturally, the first response is to relate to an individual one knows in terms of personal history, hence old friend. The exclamatory abruptness of the admirable hue, however, is striking. Dramatically, the M dash seems a much harder break than the slew of semicolons that precede it. We begin then to see a subtextual discomfort creeping into the narration. This is also developed lexically. Admirable, a term almost uniformly connected with him across the novel, is hardly the most intimate term of endearment, and one rarely used by Wolf in any other setting, reminding us of the distance that seems to exist between Whitbread and those that surround him. Many years later, towards the end of a diary entry in November 1940, Wolf briefly references an admirable naval man, and we might suggest there is an echo of Whitbread's remote respectability about it. Notably, despite his recurrent presence, we never gain the insight into his consciousness, besides his brief rumination that he did not, did not go deeply, that we access in the Dalloways, Peter Walsh, Sally Seaton, and even the similarly minor presence of Miss Kilmer. That his only moment of self-reflection, as we see, emerges from the sight of his own reflection, it seems to confirm his commitment to the superficial and the external. Given the elision in the completed novel of his knowledge of Freud described in the hours, shown here, this obsession with the external over the internal seems all the more resonant. Just as he is repeatedly dismissed as blind to the world around him by other major characters, so it seems we as readers are left as blind to his authentic interiority as he appears to be. Appropriately for our castle figure, we might suggest, there is something fundamentally inaccessible about his presence that we, along with Clarissa, cannot penetrate. The description of his well-covered stature might just as well be a psychological analysis as a physical description. Communicating, for instance, his wife's un otherwise unspecified ailment by intimating, even to a supposedly old friend, draws our attention more directly to his presence than his subjectivity, and it is this divide between the two that makes him so striking. Although the silence around his wife has previously been taken as a broader social satire and reticence around feminine physicality, this is Sarah Crangle's reading of the scene in terms of menopause in modernism and modernity, I suggest this focus on his visual appearance over dialogic content as a broader form of significance. In a roughly contemporary diary entry written during the composition of what had just been christened The Common Reader, Wolf claimed characters are to be merely views, personality is to be voided at all costs. I'm sure my Conrad adventure taught me this. We might question the integrity of this divide between views and personality more generally, but in the case of Hugh Whitbread, it seems a less contentious claim that we might otherwise expect of one of Wolf's characters. As Peter Walsh recalls, Whitbread is dismissed by Sally Seaton as the perfect specimen of the English public school type, and that no country but England could have produced him. Apparently, then, he is as red as, red as typical as much by the fellow inhabitants of the textual world as us as by us as consumers of it. After all, even with a statement not explicitly present in the book, it seems hard to imagine reaching any other conclusion, given our lack, lack of access to anything beneath his outward presentation. Implicitly, he seems to accept and conform to his stereotypical role, regardless of its being forced on him by others. This apparent obsession with his presence extends, it seems, to the reception of his physical form. Indeed, his appearance seems a particularly clear example of Wolf's supposed Conradian inheritance, inasmuch as his weight is used to visually code his ethical status in the same way that we often find in Conrad's later novels. In a recent article for the Journal of Modern Literature, Mi Jong Lee equates the moral status of the anarchists and the secret agent with their visual appearances, focusing particularly on the obesity of the eponymous agent, Mr. Burlock, and the ticket of Lee's apostle, Michaelis. As he puts it, obesity is not only a code for inactivity, however, but also culturally understood as a literal disease, both directly resulting from and causing more inactivity. We might suggest something similar occurs in Mrs. Dalloway. Just as for Doris Kilman, it is the flesh that she returns to in her moral reflections, the constant and various and generous references to Whitbread's weight further contribute to our sense of his uncomfortably significant physical presence within the textual world. Returning to his introductory passage, his appearance alongside pouched waddling birds seems far from incidental associating him from the outset with the visual atypicality of his excess weight. I'm not here claiming a direct intertextual relationship between the two novels, though it is perhaps worth noting the disastrous 1922 stage adaptation of The Secret Agent, of which Wolfe would likely have been aware. Nonetheless, visibly overweight characters are similarly unusual in Wolfe's Wolf novels, and we might suggest a similar visual coding is at work here, particularly in terms of the values assigned to employment. Notably, Whitbread's labour is constantly dismissed or diminished by others, well encapsulated by Peter Walsh's pithy remark that he blacked the king's boots or counted bottles at Windsor. Absurd and spiteful a claim as this is, the image is nevertheless a revealing one, suggestive of a broader system of assigning moral value to labour. In demeaning his work in service of the ultimate civil establishment order, namely the monarchy, Walsh attempts to reduce him to a figure of comedy, albeit un somewhat uncomfortably given his own lack of success. 
His dismissal of the court with the oriental image of the pernicious hubble bubble, after all, suggests that conceptually he remains a thousand miles across the sea despite his geographical movement. Tacitly, we might suggest, the stability of the decidedly occidental Whitbread, Whitbread seems untroubled. Just as Walsh may come to depend on Whitbread for employment if Clarissa has her way, the very terms by which he attempts to denigrate the servant of the imperial state are saturated in the language of the system Hugh Whitbread represents. One of the last things said about him in the novel, after all, is Sally Seaton's dismissal of his family of respectable coal merchants, once again proving as much generative as dismissive in its depiction of the status. Putting to one side the overt class-based antipathy inherent in the statement, we might consider its resonance as a symbol. In the association with the resource that founded the industrialized imperial state beginning its decline as the novel opens, Whitbread is, despite the sarcasm, further implicated as an ethical agent within established systems of authority. Having established the ways in which the novel does cast framework bread as ethical subject within the text, I'll now turn to his broader ethical significance, both within the novel and without. I suggest that through Whitbread, we witness the confluence of personal and formal ethics for Wolf, combining her depiction of social relations with the more direct criticism of familiar male presences. As we see through Wolf's correspondence, Whitbread's function in relation to Wolf's per personal notions of ethical value is unambiguous. In a letter to Philip Morell following the novel's publication, she straightforwardly claims that she meant Hugh Whitbread to be hated, as indeed Morell did. To offer such a direct ethical imperative regarding one of her characters presents us with unusually clear insight into the textual expression of her relationship with masculine authority and its reception by her peers. Indeed, incidental though it is to this paper, we might also note Wolfe's surprise that Morell had equal disdain for Richard Dalloway, arguably an outwardly more benign present. The supposed biographical basis for this hatred in any case is well known and well-worn critical ground. Often the only comments made on Whitbread's function following Hermione Lee's suggestion that he's a caricature of Walter Lamb or Christina Fuller's more recent connection of his violence with the abusive figure of George Duckworth, subsequently taken up by Anne Fernald in her recent edition of the Cambridge Works. Demonstrably, it seems, there is a personal basis to Walt's ethical imperative to hate the figure of Whitbread. More important for this paper is how this hatred, irrespective of its origin, functions in terms of the textual thought world and its social relations. We are all, I imagine, familiar with Wolf's day-to-day -day and to criticise the social system and to show it at work at its most intense, not least because it's verdling. But how often do we recall the qualification that follows it, that here I may be posing? It is this ambivalence, I suggest, as much as the more familiar social critique that we see expressed within the novel through the humorous but inescapably sinister presence of Hugh Whitbread. That his elevated position afloat on the cream of English society affords him the right of arbitration to look critically and magisterially, magisterially at socks and shoes exemplifies this instant, insistent deflation of his supposed authority well, reducing him to the fussy mannered province of social decorum. Akin to the stately plump Buck Mulligan of another great modern city novel, we seem to be invited to see his authority as consistently undercut. Nonetheless, it remains authority of a kind. As Barbara Johnson claims in an essay on Winnicott, if ethics is defined in relation to the potentially violent excesses of the subject's power, then that power is in reality being presupposed and reinforced in the very attempt to undercut it. The constant satire that surrounds him, we might suggest, reinforces his conservative authority as much as it does his outward absurdity. Early in the novel, for instance, we're told that even Clarissa feels a little skimpy schoolgirlish around him, seemingly born in part from being conscious of her hat. Similarly, as we saw earlier, Miss Brush resents her replying that her brother is doing very well in South Africa when for half a dozen years he'd been doing badly in Portsmouth. Although both of these episodes are no doubt comic in the triviality of the concerns they foreground, they're nevertheless reminded of the discomfort and the control he imposes. For all his absurdity, his ability to enforce socially acceptable behaviour through his treatment of women is nonetheless a recurrent and unsettling force throughout the, the text. In the sense of ethics as a system of social values, we might suggest that Whitbread acts as an uncomfortable ethical centre for the society Mrs. Dalloway explores. And uh, I'm now moving on to the section where the uh, violence is depicted more graphically. It is when he's presented as, directly, as a directly involved ethical agent, however, that Hugh Whitbread is at his most disturbing. Taking ethics in Spinoza's sense of the term, in terms of living harmoniously and being of assistance to one another, as parts of a state in service of reason, we see Whitbread take on an altogether more disturbing role. Bearing in mind the Spinozan dictum that activity is existence, we turn now to the most ethically significant of Whitbread's actions, all the more striking for a character seen so often as a static presence, his assault of Sally Seaton. Recollections of this event are recurrent throughout the party scene, but it is phrased with a particularly striking effect in Clarissa's description of the accusation, of kissing her in the smoking room to punish her for saying that women should have votes. Verb forms of punish are exceptionally rare across Wolf's works, occurring to my knowledge only three times elsewhere in the novels. 
a piece of kit. In none of these other cases, crucially, is it so directly associated with one character acting on another. Here, by contrast, it demonstrates Whitbread's enforcement of social normativity, akin to the stamping out of impropriety earlier discussed, with a kind of causal logic Wolf generally leaves implicit. Returning to Spinoza's schema, it seems Whitbread's prevention of social harm in responding directly to Seekers' professed reformism is achieved only through directly harming her through sexual aggression. As we see in the examples from Night and Day on Orlando, the Punisher is either unspecified or divine, making its embodiment here in the form of Hugh Whitbread uniquely unsettling. We do not, for instance, see a directly comparable action as evidence for the frequently re referenced tyranny of Mr. Ramsey, another troubling figure of male authority. In Mrs. Dalloway, by contrast, it is these very actions and their consequences that are so disturbing as the punishment inflicted by Whitbread is both unchallenged, abetted by Clarissa, and apparently successful. While well, her pro proto bohemian youthful progressiveness, after all, Sally Seaton seems to resign herself to the provincial bourgeois heteronormativity she once opposed. There are five enormous boys, note incidentally the relation of size, masculinity and size here, and wealthy husband in Manchester. Just as Septimus is driven by William Bradshaw and divine proportion to a more literal destruction, then, we might suggest that in Hugh Whitbread we find a parallel ethical arbiter capable, despite his absurdity, of enforcing a restrictive domestic ideology. Most disturbing of all about Whitbread, then, is that for all he is mocked and denigrated, his ability to punish seems ultimately effective. Thus, as an ethical agent, he is foundational, returning to Rosenstock's term, inasmuch as his enforcement of social norms seems deceptively significant in fashioning the relationships of the now adult characters and not what follows. In correcting Sally Seaton's youthful indiscretion, he forcibly reasserts the conservative values Wolf sets out to critique. In summary, then, Hugh Whitbread acts as a deceptively significant ethical force in Mrs. Dalloway, both as an authority presence and agent of violent oppression. Through both linguistic and visual coding, Wolf fashions him as an agent of what Lacan calls the sublime virtues of social pressure, in other words, the real, acting as an unsettling counterpoint to the thought worlds of Clarissa and her transcendental theory of human value, or Septimus's increasing departure into the realms of linguistic fantasy. The inescapably embodied Hugh Whitbread, by contrast, acts instead as a very physical reminder of a more restrictive social, social system, usually not so overtly discussed in Wolf's narratives, underpinned by the violent enforcement both of ethical norms and the necessary silence around them. In the constant attempts to draw attention to Whitbread's absurdities, this system seems paradoxically strengthened, as the mockery by which those around Whitbread attempt to diminish him seem to foreground little but their own effectiveness in disturbing the stability of this unsettling bastion of late Georgian notions of social ethics. There is, of course, far more to be said about Hugh Whitbread's role within the broader patterns of violence, of male violence across Wolf's corpus, but I hope this paper has gone some way towards encouraging fresh considerations of a generally neglected figure. Although he may often be dismissed by characters within the novel itself, as we've seen, it seems to me that doing so only reproduces the same patriarchal narratives by which his power is sustained. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a brilliant presentation. Um, so let's just again take for two minutes and then um, join for the last presentation of this month. 
All right, I think we can start with our last presentation. Um, so I'll introduce the third speaker. Chen Rupeng is a third year PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. Rupeng's research focuses majorly on Virginia Woolf's sphere and how this particular affect and its entailed reconception of knowledge shape her literary forms, political engagement, and the idea of human history. Okay, okay. Uh, I think I need to share the screen now. And, uh, oh gosh. Oh. Okay, okay, no worries. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, my presentation is around Wolf's conspiratorial device about terrorist war code briefers. In October 1940, Wolf wrote in her diary that if it were not treasonable to say so, a day like this is almost too, I won't say happy, but amenable. And we are on our lovely free autumn island. Wolf's use of the treasonable has its particular resonance when read alongside her other wartime di diaries. During Wolf's composition of Between the Acts, she acutely felt, felt the presences of foreign and domestic conspiracies. Noting her diary twice, listening to the broadcaster William Joyce, also known of the, as the Lord Howe Howe, who was convicted for treason and prosecuted in January 1946 by Britain. Apart from that, she and Leonard were exposed directly to the domestic terrorist attacks. One of her diaries in January 1939 read, yesterday 300 bullets were, for, were found thrown into the bushes the other side of Tavistock Square. One of the Irish rebels lodged in Tavistock Square were court. This hidden plot of the Irish Republic Army brought terror in citizens and prompted the secret agents like an author like Elizabeth Bowen to carry out missions in Ireland. Bowen's letters to Wolf informs the letter about the state of secrecy and conspiracy. Though Bowen disclosed only dimly her intelligent labor, it is very likely that secrecy and espionage looming Wolf's final fiction, especially when we look into the character Isa Oliver. She appears just what she is at the same time, quote, Sir Richard's daughter and the niece of the two old ladies at Wimbledon, who are so proud, being all news of their descent from the Kings of Ireland. Wolf's name names Isa a conspirator, not solely with her Anglo-Irish descendant in, um, in mind. Isa's secret seeking of Robert Hyans, the local farmer, has ignored her adulterous desires accompanied by her hidden right hand. The worst one's worth writing the book banned like an accounting book in case Giles suspected. Her fear of being exposed as an adulterous wife is contrasted with her unwilling allegiance to the role of the maternal figure in the heterosexual family. She disavows herself anyway to resemble Sappho, just re and thus reject rejecting the homosexuality. We can notice here in Isa a figure not unlike Bowen of a double agent one that conjoins secret selves and treachery together with the, their passings as state's subject. In other words, Issa's conspiracy tests the limit of the wartime paranoia to tell friends from enemy to distinguish us from them, revealing a sexualized heteronormative logic that assimilates some forms of different desires like Issa's to, nation, to national identification only to subjugate others, especially the queer objects to the status of enemy terrorists. Looming behind is a secret act, secret act is her husband, Charles Oliver, who similarly has an extramarital affair with Mrs. Manresa. It desperately attempts to shore up British exceptionalism against the threat of total war, which features not merely visible enemies, but also invisible infiltrations of homosexual. David Chorter regards this mentality as a wartime paranoia, an operative homostatic system, adjusting the degree of fantasized persecution to the degree of fantasized grandeur. The moment Giles meets William, he distances himself from the letter by subjugating queer object subjects allow William to the non-civilized, even conspiratorial enemy. Giles bolsters the sexual exceptionalism of Britain, um, which distinguishes the masculinities of patriotism from the perverse bodies of conspirator marked by queerness at their references of malfunction. Yet Giles's conspiracy theory for all its insistence on very similitude and clear demarcation, nevertheless is a fantasy of the paranoid, whose desire to assert his exceptional virility and patriotism is under severe threat. 
Neither the stone kicking game nor the violent crushing of the perverted body, assemb body assemblage of toad and snake releases his anxiety of a defeat, or in other words, emasculation. In this way, Giles's conspiratorial representation does not validate his sovereignty through demarcating between the friend and foe, between the man and the so-called half-man. On the contrary, his status as the patriarchal and patriotic sovereign is featured by his executive fever, which ironically lays bare his incommensurability with the totality of wartime society. What comes even more remarkably is the necropolitics under the forced disguise of the individual and the collective security. A Chilimbembe's analysis of necropolitics is pertinent to approach as conspiracy pertinent here as conspiracy representation as a form that features figures of sovereignty whose central project is not the struggle for autonomy, but the generalized instrumentalization of human existence and the material destruction of human bodies and populations. End quote. Focusing on the increasingly tactile, sensorial, and anatomical techniques of destruction, Mbembe nevertheless indicates that it is precisely in these persecuted yet conspiring bodies of the living death that we can see hope of transformation. Returning to Wolf's invocation of a collaborative mental, flight, uh, mental fight against the current, I want to approach between the act at the same time reflective of and deviant from the executive regime of normativity. The more so, Wolf's multiple uses of conspirator ties the adulterous desire of Isa Oliver with the queer subjectivity of William Dodge. This conspiring figures whose proximity to the unacknowledged desires and everyday persecution, nevertheless, poses readers in the blood zone of conspiracy and sacrifice, transformation and ultimate negation. Stephen Barber offers a lovely interpretation of Wolf in Conspiracy as other writing, an inscription that is knowable, if unrepresentable as such, though a through and as the responsibility is a trace of the other. While I agree with Barber that Wolf in Conspiracy is a half-articulated communication that does, come to, does not come to surface or representation, it lies deeply in the affected life of the conspirator. I would propose that the metamorphosis of Issa's conspiratorial gestures indicates Wolf's refusal to merely attach the future of literature with a transcendent, even formless writing. Instead, the gestures ground literature onto the plastic capacity of the human bodies to give, receive, even acknowledge the forms they inhabit. It is um, appropriate to turn to the etymology of the conspire, which means to breathe together. How Foster further encourages us to take the multivalence of breathers into consideration by consideration by bringing breath in conversation with its ancient Greek form, pneuma, which indicates animating the living in spirit and in form. Foster's reading of the conspiracy acknowledges that the conspirators are disposable bare life, yet at the same time endows the imagery of co-breathers with an anachronistic life to be reanimated by each present that conjures it up. In what follows, I will focus on the gestures as the animating sign of conspiracy, whose efficacy lies in its very capacity to affect others, with not merely its surface message, but also with its underlying pathos. Jose Esteban Munoz suggests that even if a gesture might be too ephemeral to be coherent with degrees of intelligibility, that exploration does not equal non-substantiality. On the contrary, this passing gestures rematerialize, representing a valuable interruption in the coercive choreography of a here and now that has scored to naturalize and validate cultural logics such as capitalism and heterosexuality. Going back to Wolf's novel, we can find that during the interval of the pageant, Issa looks desolately around her, and her desolation is inscribed to a set of gestures. Quote, down the right, the leaves that down the right that leads under the nut tree and the may tree away, till I come to the wishing well, where the washerwoman's little boy. She dropped her sugar, two lumps into a tea, dropped a tip, dropped a pain. But what wish should I drop into the well? That the water should cover me of the wishing well. But repeatedly dropping, Issa passes from the ordinary habit to the fairy tale of washerman's washerwoman's little boy and to the fantasized drowning of herself. The repetition of drop, dropping does not mark the finitude of this meaningful gesture, 
insect is just uh, transmutes and regenerates, allowing it uh, to be in conspiracy with even the ghostly existence of the lady who, who appeared before and is said to have joined herself for love. This haunting figure of John the Lady is both a ghost from the past and a ghost of future, reanimating and troubling the present Issa inhabits. Indeed, Issa's gesture stores the progression of national history and the celebration of England at its prime, rather for a river, reverberation of banal habits and fantastic vision, real life and Gothic territory. Issa's gesture to drop, uh, to drop a pain into the wishing well it's a combination of desperate wish fulfillment of a desire and her renunciation of own self, rendering the dissolution of identity a reframed ground where secret encounters with those who can recognize, indulge, even participate in her conspiratorial desires can take place. Following this gesture and a series of images indicating death and dropping up the deadly fall comes William Dodge, her conspirator. When Issa invites William to the greenhouse, a greenhouse, she adopts another gesture, quote, I pluck the bitter herb by the ruined wall, the churchyard wall, and press it sour, as sweet as sour, long gray leaf, so twixt stump and finger. This gesture of twisting and pressing indicates Ace's uh, speculation of William's queer desire, and her invitation of William is well received by his picking up the, sh the shred of old man's bed, she just flows away taking the furry leaf and pressing it between thumb and finger. Thus enacted, their shared desire reaffirmed their binding to each other. Their conspiratorial de desires to seek the hidden faces demand from us readers a transformative recognition. The conspiracy culminates when the play is over and Issa parts with William. Issa repeats the gesture when they recognize each other in the first place. Quote, in passing, she stripped the bitter leaf that grew as it happened outside the nursery window, old man's bed, shriveling the shred in lieu of words, for no words grow there, no roses either. She swept past her conspirator, her son loved, the seekers after the vanished faces, like Venus, he thought, making a rough translation to her prey. The gesture here is marked by its ephemerality and the vagueness, a secrecy whose message cannot be, de cannot be delivered completely in lieu of words, for no words grow there. It is more than an expression of desire for recognition of her desire of Robert Hayens, but mourns for the lost possibilities, becoming itself an ephemeral, yet vast storehouses of these unrealized histories and futurities. Issa's frustration with the heteronormative presence is scripted onto her body, where every nerve and the movement is now torn between passion and passivity, the flesh poured over her, the hot, nerve-wired, now lit up, now dark as the grave of physical, physical body. The fabulous surface of Issa's gesture contains a desperate call for readers to go into depth of her everyday affective torture. Thus, it is consolatory to find that within Dodge, the conspirator succeeds for all the fleetingness to receive the gesture and then his rough translation of Hassan, think out of the wilderness. The translation itself allows a wild marriage between English and French as well, the suffering and the passion and his attentive participation in the conspiracy. A healing of Issa's rusty fester on the poison dart is conducted in the way he desires to be healed by the conspiracy with Lucy Thwissing, but to have healed me. The conspiratorial gestures does move beyond the cycle of fear, hatred, discrimination, and extermination, dominating the patriotic heteronormative nationalism. Indeed, even if the conspirators sees no retreating and advancing in future, they conspire to bring into the fourth stage of here and now, however ephemerally, an array of disarticulated secrets and hopefully a consolatory healing. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jen. So, um... After the next two minutes, we'll all um, join back and then just share our comments and questions if any. 
if everyone is back, we can start with the Q and A. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself and share that with us. So I don't see any questions in the chat box. I was wondering if I could start with one. So um, this is in relation to James's presentation. James, uh, if, if you position you as the rock, then um, how do you think we can understand Evelyn? And I ask this because in the final lines of Clarissa's conversation with you, it's revealed that she feels very schoolgirlish around him. And if his old friend feels like that, then I, I was just wondering if it's a possibility that, you know, um, his wife's condition is perhaps uh, very much affected by the kind of hyper-masculine pers persona that he has, or perhaps if Hugh is in a way also trying to construct a falsified pretext to extend his control over his wife. So again, uh, in short, the question would be, how do we understand Evelyn if he was the rock? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. Um... I mean, I think what strikes me most about the way she appears is just how much is kind of elided in Mrs. Dalloway from um, Mrs. Dalloway in Bond Street, where it's very clear that what she's suffering from is the menopause, hence um, Sarah Krangle's reading um, in Monsters and Modernity. Um, I forget quite how she said, I mean, it's expressed in a very clearest way, but it's something along the lines of, oh, she must be 50 something now. It happens at that sort of age, you know, and so it's very euphemistic, but it, you know, it's very much, there is a clear sort of, ailment sort of associated with it. But what I think is interesting is that, that, that that's gone and Mrs. Delaware and therefore, you know, our focus falls more firmly on Q and indeed why he doesn't say anything about it. And I think that's, you know, a general trend. If you look at, you know, the same elsewhere in the hours, there's this continual sense of any kind of complexity about him or anything going on in his life beyond the way he appears has been sort of removed sort of quite systematically by Wolf. You know, if you look at that, that the, um, the scene where she's talking about Freud and Stravinsky and so on, sort of increasingly less detail there. So I suppose the point is, you know, she's increasingly sort of hidden behind the rook, if you like, in that it seems that Wolf's editing foregrounds him increasingly over any, anybody else in, in his life. So I suppose that that's sort of what it what it comes down to is that the reason we don't hear very much more about her is because that's almost the point is that he becomes almost this sort of hole into which any sort of detail is just sort of obscured. Thanks for responding to that. Um, if we don't have any other questions from the attendees, perhaps we can also start an exchange among the panelists that we have today. So um, if you have any questions for each other or just plain comments, then feel free to share that as well, just to guide the conversation. May I speak a bit about about James's paper? It's very lovely, and uh, and I see that in your discussion about Hugh, and and there is a brief reference to his status as a bureaucratic in for the monarch, and I think it's very um, relevant to the discussion of Hugh as the rook, as far as he is the foundation of the patriarchal imperialist society. He is also the standing figure for the bureaucrat for the bureaucracy. And whose major like the feature, according to Max Weber and other um, like, like Max Weber and Zygmunt Bauman, is also its impersonality. It's neutralized figure, neutralized being in the in the society, which is completely which completely steers him away from being actually in presence. And I I think it can be like. Uh, a, a relevant point to link the status of Hugh as uh, uh, the elation of Hugh with his standing as a uh, rook or his like bureaucratic status. So this is my comment. I think it's very lovely point to, for uh, point for you to connect Hugh to the poem model and all this kind of uh, psychological reading. It's very um, engaging, and I really love that. Oh, thank you. I mean, one thing on the point of personality that I think is interesting, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but so much of his, you know, power, such as it is, 
it's talked about in terms of the way you know he does express things sort of somewhat personally but in a very sort of conventionalized way you know i'm thinking of the um, the letters to the times and you know the, the lady britain sort of enlists his support because he knows how to put things and it's a it's a really interesting sort of balance i think in the way that you know that he can do that because he's a particular sort of person and we all know he's a particular sort of person but at the same time the kind of the conventionality of that of that sort of communication strips out any sort of individuality so you know it, in a sense, he's his impersonality is almost his personality, and you know, hence, hence the sort of the rook figure and so on. I have a question for Doctor Bond, um, if I may. So, yeah. So you you actually talked about how Rose was unable to articulate her trauma throughout the text. Um, I think this came up towards the end of the presentation, and I feel that if we also compare that with what happens in Mrs. Dalloway, we observe that uh, Clarissa also, in a way, to some extent, lacks the language to um, reflect on her domesticity. So my question is: Do you see a pattern in the way Wolf actually reflects on uh, different forms of violence? Um, in, in relation to gender? I do. I think uh, one of Wolf's major themes throughout her work is critiquing the way that, you know, patriarchal cultures um, don't provide the language for women to share about their experiences, whether they're related to violence or something else. Um, thinking about Evelyn, even, you know, it's like, well, of course, Hugh talks about her illness in, in indeterminate ways because women's ailments like menopause are, are not on the radar in a bit, you know, like that's not something you talk about or care to understand. Um, and it's interesting to parallel that with like Richard and Clarissa's experiences of Clarissa, you know, of Clarissa going through that same stage of life because they also can't communicate that, um, you know, Clarissa has her really deep um, retrospective kind of series of scenes when she goes upstairs to take her nap and um, where she's recalling her relationship with Richard and, um, even though they cannot communicate, like it's clear that her and Richard have the same kind of detachment or, or inability to relate. There's also a warmth and desire to communicate between her and Richard that maybe is lacking between Hugh and Evelyn. Um, but but so, so to answer, sorry, that I know that's unrelated to, to Maya text that I was talking about, but I do think it, it is a nice connection and just showing that I think one of Wolf's major purposes was showing the limitations of, um, of just language and communication. And um, of course, violence against women and children would not, you know, people didn't take it very seriously. So why make an effort toward creating a language that would express it or create spaces for that language? So I think, you know, it was part of Wolf's critique of the patriarchy that she did make those spaces. And um, one of my favorite works by Wolf is A Sketch of the Past. And, you know, it was not published during her lifetime, but she did um, explicitly write about the first time she was, or one of the first times she was molested by her stepbrothers in that memoir. And I mean, I just think of how brave that, that was of her. Um, and so I do think that probably her earlier works, she was attempting to express these things in different ways, um, probably also working through her own, you know, personal trauma with similar experiences. Um, you know, that we do eventually see her come right out and explicitly voice eventually, if even if it is like after her death, um, when, when that sketch is, is published. But um, interestingly, the scene that happens with Rose, she found in a newspaper, uh, so that a lot of people have said that, that they are linking it to like Wolf's personal life. Um, I think it was probably actually more linked to just things that were happening and being reported upon in the news. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me that it actually was important enough for a newspaper to pick it up and, and publish it like they they reported on what happened to a child. Um, but it was apparently like a very small clipping. So then Wolf of course take up, takes that and makes it the basis for her entire novel because it's the very first chapter. So I do think she's also kind of challenging uh, the discourse of the day and, and saying, you know, this is how it's being treated. It's a very small snippet, but I'm going to blow that up and show how something that may, maybe seems minor or unimportant is actually at the very foundation of our, our culture. So I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but um, that's my best shot at it. It does, thank you. In fact, you talk about, uh, you, you just talk, talked about how it was brave for Wolf to um, also express uh, and just share uh, the different ways in which she had experienced 
violence because it was not really common for women to do that at that time. And it also reminds me that in this is Galloway, there is this one instance where um, Septimus is, I think, um, he, he hears some sparrows singing in Greek words. And there's an interesting article by Robert, no, sorry, the Roger Poole, who actually connects this image with um, certain kind of a sexual violence that Wolf experienced in her own life. So Leonard Wolf mentioned, um, I think twice in a certain text that um, she, Virginia Wolf had actually heard certain sparrows um, singing in Greek. And this is also connected with um, the fact that George Duckworth, who was, um, I think her Greek teacher had actually molested her when she was young. So I think it's it's just very interesting how she's able to bring about these different um, different ways, different things in her private life to um, the texts that she writes. So yeah, thank you. If I can just go back a little bit, we were talking about, um, you know, sort of what is and isn't appropriate to communicate. Again, thinking about Mrs. Dalloway and Bond Street, there's another interesting moment in the, the Hugh Whitbread sort of episode where she says something along the lines of, uh, she felt he was like a brother to her and heaven knows one wouldn't, one couldn't say anything to one's brother or something, you know, and there is this sense very much, therefore, you know, there are certain things that are, you know, not appropriate to discuss in male company, however intimate. And I think that's very much sort of what, you know, as we've said, what goes on here in terms of, Sort of the willingness and the capacity to communicate between people being just sort of forbidden by, you know, this, this, these sort of social values that people like you at Bread were sort of enforcers of. I have a question for Chen, but it, it may be a very misinformed uh, question. So if it sounds silly, just reframe it, Chen. But um, I was looking at your slides, I downloaded them, and I was um, thinking about how you were talking about the etymology of um, cons conspiracy and conspire, and you linked it to um, the Greek uh, form pneuma. Um, and I was looking at that definition, which says animating the living in spirit and in form. And I, I really enjoyed the scenes you talked about in between the acts, but I wonder, um, have you seen that in other novels by what, or other works? Like, do you see this, this, I, this concept of conspiring that you talked about? Um, I guess it's, it's a similar question to um, Ridula in that, is this a theme that you see across Wolf or do you think this was something new she was experimenting with in this last novel? And, and if the latter, you know, why, like, I guess what would be bringing her to think about um, this at that particular moment? Um, I, and, and actually it's like the conspiracy has appeared several times in wolf fiction. So especially in the waves, there is like the conspiracy between Luis and the Roda. And this is something not new. It's not new. It's um, the, the, the conspiracy also appears like in free Guinness. It's like the outside the society is, is is sort of like to be united by a conspiracy of silence. So I don't think it's like, it, it can be a sort of like a permanent, not a permanent, but a perennial engagement of Wolf with the personal intimacy with be, between each other. Yet the important thing about the, between the acts and the conspiracy that between the acts is exactly located in the wartime period. So the conspiracy is more likely to be connected with the national paradigm to cast the citizen, to cast the, the idealize the citizens from the homosexual, from the foreign spies. And it can be more literally, I, I would like to say. But again, the more literally, the more significant the conspiracy is for this nation state, the more, um, the more likely the wolf can use this trope to create something like a reanimation, create something that can allow us to pip into the conspiratorial uh, gestures that reanimate the homosexual desires. So it's like, like in in the waves, Rhoda is also portrayed, especially in the holograph of the waves, Rhoda is portrayed as a homosexual as Espen, but in the final version of the waves, it is eliminated, um, it is um, omitted. But in the in between the arts, the manifest 
the manifestation of uh, uh, of William Dodge's homosexuality and his connection with Issa Oliver is way more obvious. So I think it can be uh, the significance of me to link between the arcs to the cons conspiracy. But definitely, as you have suggested, this can be like a perennial engagement of Wolf with the uh, interpersonal relationship. Um, I have another question for Dr. Bond. Um, so speaking of the ways how Rhoda is very reluctant to be seen as um, as feminine or as um, kind of a subject of desire, um, some would say because of fear, um, how would that tie into um, Wolf portraying women in the society as either like, um, subject of like silent um, violence or like how would that tie into what you're speaking about today? It's an interesting question. Others here may also want uh, have ideas because this I, I don't know if I have a quick response. Um, I think that Wolf you know, she is a product of her time. So her feminism is not the same as, as how we would define feminism today. And sometimes I do feel like Wolf falls into some problematic binaries, you know, of e even though she, in her model of androgyny, like in A Room of One's Own, she tries to get away from binaries. I still feel like sometimes she imagines things as either or, you know, like you are either um, kind of like the Fanny Elmer in Jacob's Room, like the artist model, like the, the passive, recipient of the male gaze, or you're this other uh, type of woman who completely rejects that almost in like a masculine sense. Like, like I still feel like she kind of imagines women's subjectivity along the um, feminine masculine binary rather than as a spectrum sometimes. I mean, she has instances, of, I don't want to make that major claim, but she has a spectrum too. But I feel like some, some of her female characters like Rose or maybe like Rhoda, um, she pushes to the extreme, you know, maybe for failure or inability to express something in the middle, like something that could be someone who could have agency while also being feminine, if that makes sense. Um, I think our, like I said, I think today we have much more nuanced definitions of what a feminist can be and look like that maybe we're just not quite there for a wolf yet. So she might've fallen into that trap of thinking, oh, to be feminist, you must either imagine something new altogether, which then how do we express that? Um, you know, that she kind of ends three guineas in that way. It's like, but, but what else? Uh, like what would be an entirely new society? Um, or you kind of fall into the trap of just being more like men, which then she also critiques. So like, you know, she's critical of Rose and she's so somewhat critical of Rhoda too. Uh, so, so I don't know if that, that's a roundabout way of seeing that this might just be I think this, I mean, I don't want to speak for Wolf because I'm not her, but I think that perhaps this would have been a struggle for her, like how to imagine a female subjectivity that is not completely passive um, and limited by the male gaze, but that's also not just becoming a, like a man, um, you know, which she experiments with in Orlando too. So, <laughs> and, and that's a very uh, progressive take on, on how to handle, handle that problem. Um, so perhaps that's what's going on there. Maybe we can wait for a few more minutes to see if anyone else has any questions or comments and then we can close the panel if that's okay. Um, 
I'm just picking up on this idea of kind of Wolf and the, you know, the either or and the extremes. I mean, I think this speaks to something of her sort of broader kind of aesthetic patterning is that everybody sort of has to stand for something and be a certain sort of type or something, you know, for sort of extreme forms of femininity and the waves and so on. You know, I think all of her characters in one way or another fall into this, you know, fall into something. You know, I think in order to sort of fit into her systems, there has to be something you identify with them more strongly than anything else. You know, and I wonder if that's not so much a gender thing as just a sort of broader sort of way of seeing the world. I mean, she talks in, I think it's moments of being about, you know, um, there, there's no God, no Beethoven, it's, you know, just the words and sort of this, this thing about looking for kind of the thing in itself, I think she brings out very much in the fiction by, you know, making characters very extreme types of certain things. So I, mean, I wonder if that's a helpful way of looking at, you know, sort of her conceptions of or, you know, the way in which she deploys character's gender in terms of looking at gender. That's a really good point. And it reminds me, Clarissa Dalloway, um, one thing that's interesting about her character is that it's repeated many, many times throughout Mrs. Dalloway that she is neither this nor that. Um, and so I wonder if uh, with that novel in particular, Wolf was really grappling with, with, um, with that tendency that she has to kind of type people and perhaps she was trying to break out of it a little bit, but but then, of course, Car Carissa, she, you know, Wolf wasn't particularly fond of her character, and she's kind of an enigma <laughs> until the end. So um, maybe it wasn't a highly successful experiment. But she does say that several times, you know, not this or that. And in a sketch of the past, she does that as well about herself. You know, she says, "We, I cannot say that I am this or I am that. Um, so maybe just part of the creative process of we're given types, so that's how we think of things. But then when we try to move past that, it's like, how else do we communicate? Because our entire system of, of existing is based on these patterns and types. So if we try to explain ourselves beyond those, we, um, we risk be, you know, miscommunication or misunderstanding with our audiences. But I, 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 I just to talk a bit about the extremity thing. It's like I found that in late Wolf, especially like in um, in Free Guinness and Between the Arcs, there is more likely to be the queerness of the gender, sort of like how the gender can be in the recent article by Katrina Katrina Nader Winston. She also talks about the transgender. The transgender, like in Orlando, we can see that the gender is completely flowing, and also like gender can be like on the on the uh, 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 scripted on the cloth on which he or she puts on. It's something that that I think I think is like in in earlier Wolf she could be a bit towards oriented towards the extremity of the expression about how gender can be, how the essentialized gender might be. But in late Wolf, especially after the Orlan publication of Orlando, the transgender and especially the with the development of embryo, embryology, uh, with the development of modern, modern social science about uh, modern social science, uh, modern medical sciences about the transgender operations. I think here for Wolf, especially for Wolf in her late period, she has in her mind the ambition and also the uh, target of transfiguring the masculinity and femininity and promote something like a uh, transness, though definitely with regard to the wound, already wounded body of the female and also the uh, sovereign bodies of the masculinity. So I think it's, it's my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. Thank you.
Do we want to wrap up early? It seems like everybody's ran out of, of steam. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a plan. Thank you so much for attending everyone. And uh, thank you to all of our panelists for such brilliant presentations. Um, thank you. So we can all then just leave the call for the short break. Thank you very much for being such a great host, uh, Regula and Victoria. And nice to meet everybody. All right, goodbye.